Hello, I'm Dr. Karen Zagian. I'm a colorectal surgeon in Los Angeles. Uh, one of my passions as a surgeon is J-pouch surgery. Uh, that, along with rectal cancer, um, is part of my niche. And today we're going to be talking about pouchitis. Pouchitis is a common complication after uh, J-pouch surgery. And it's actually the most common complication when you've had surgery um, in the setting of ulcerative colitis or inflammatory bowel disease unclassified. And this is thought to be due to an immune gut microbial interaction. Pouchitis affects nearly 100% of patients who have a J pouch in the setting of ulcerative colitis. And it can affect up to 48% of patients in the first two years after surgery. Some patients may go on to develop chronic pouchitis, and another complication that is dreaded among our patients is Crohn's-like disease of the pouch. Um, patients who have pouch surgery in the set setting of primary sclerosing cholangitis, a liver condition, are very high risk for development of pouchitis and should be co uh, counseled about this significantly increased risk before they undergo this operation. So before we get into how we manage pouchitis, let's talk first about what normal pouch function may be. And normal pouch function um, in the early postoperative period may look something like 20 bowel movements a day. People have control over those 20 bowel movements for the most part without significant urgency. Um, however, patients early on, immediately postoperatively, uh, can have nocturnal bowel movements. Those are bowel movements occurring at night. And they may have daytime and nighttime seepage. That means a little bit of stool leaking out. Over time, these symptoms improve. And by about 12 months after surgery, People can expect to have about six to eight bowel movements a, a day on average, and they may still have one to two bowel movements at night. This may become um, a part of the routine even long-term after surgery. As far as nighttime seepage goes, about one third of patients will have some form of nighttime leakage or seepage where they may have to wear a little panty liner or a pad. Okay, so then what does pouchitis involve? Pouchitis includes symptoms of frequency and urgency. These are the most common symptoms. And these symptoms um, often mimic your IBD symptoms. Patients may also have abdominal bloating and cramping. They may have bleeding and fevers even in more severe cases. The workup of pouchitis may involve stool testing such as a fecal calprotectin, stool cultures. Usually we make the diagnosis using pouchoscopy, a scope of the pouch, um, and we may use imaging to rule out other conditions that may um, mimic pouchitis, but we don't need imaging to diagnose pouchitis per se. Some of the other um, things that diagnoses that we may consider when we are considering pouchitis in a patient um, include an infection. Um, there may be ischemia or blood flow issues to the pouch. Patients may have Crohn's-like disease of the pouch. This is much less common, but we always consider it. Early in the postoperative period, patients may um, have surgical complications that may present like pouchitis. This includes an abscess, a leak at the surgical connection site, a fistula, a stricture or a narrowing, um, or floppy pouch. Floppy pouch is more of a chronic uh, pouch condition, but this involves things like kinking and twisting and prolapsing of the pouch. Um, other functional conditions, including irritable, irritable pouch syndrome or bacterial overgrowth, may also share some symptoms of pouchitis. So then what's a normal pouchoscopy look like? Before we can scope a patient and see what a inflamed pouch looks like, we need to know the pouch anatomy and know what normal pouches look like. So every pouchoscopy begins with a perianal exam. We always want to look at the anus and make sure that there aren't any ulcers or fissures or fistulas that may help with our diagnosis. Uh, 
We then want to do a digital rectal exam. This is a finger exam of the pouch and the anus to evaluate the connection point and to make sure there's no narrowing or stenosis. Once we insert our scope into the pouch, we're going to look and see if there is a cuff, a rectal cuff. In some patients having pouch surgery, the small bowel pouch may be sewn directly to the anus, whereas in other patients, we may leave a small cuff of um, rectum in order to facilitate the surgery and sometimes improve function. Understanding whether the patient has a rectal cuff may help with um, figuring out what's wrong when we're scoping patients postoperatively. A typical rectal cuff length is about two, two and a half centimeters, and it is abnormal uh, to have a long rectal cuff. And in some patients, because of difficulties with surgery and reaching down to the pelvis, surgeons sometimes may leave a cuff that is longer than the intended two, two and a half centimeters that then predispose patients to higher episodes of cuffitis, which we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about later. This picture in the left upper corner shows the normal rectal cuff. You can see the anastomosis is the circular tube at the deep part of the picture. And further up, uh, closer up to the edge of the picture is the dentate line or where the anus begins. And you can see that there's some rectum here between the surgical anastomosis and the anus. Once we insert the scope into the pouch. We're also looking up at the top of the pouch and we typically see this owl's eye appearance, um, which signifies um, the entry uh, from the uh, small intestine down into the pouch. Um, and we're looking at the staple line of the pouch to make sure that it is straight and it's not twisted. Once we've done all of that, we enter the pre-pouch ileum. We look to make sure that there isn't any inflammation or ulceration there. And generally, we'll do biopsies of both the pre-pouch ileum, the pouch, as well as the rectal cuff. So pouchitis looks something like this. On endoscopy, we'll see uh, diffuse redness or erythema. We'll see friability, erosions, ulcers, and exudate. And we may and we will see on histopathology once we take the biopsy, mucosal information, and this confirms pouchitis. Cuffitis, on the other hand, inflammation of the rectal cuff may present and look differently. Patients with cuffitis will be more likely to have symptoms of bleeding and some anal uh, and rectal discomfort without a significant amount of the um, uh, urgency and frequency symptoms as long as the rectal cuff is not longer than the intended two centimeters. Um, and tip Typically, treatment of cuffitis is different than pouchitis. For cuffitis, generally, we can do suppositories and topical treatments with steroids or mesalamine, and patients with cuffitis generally do very well as long as they have a limited short rectal cuff. Crohn's-like disease of the, uh, the pouch is this dreaded complication of pouch surgery, um, and in um, in, in patients with uh, fistulas that occur in the pouch, especially at a distance away from the original surgery, usually six to uh, 12 months after the original surgery. Patients who develop inflammation of the pre-pouch ileum or pre-pouch ileitis, or those who develop strictures of the pre-pouch ileum or pouch inlet, as you see in these pictures, um, can be reclassified as having Crohn's-like disease of the pouch. So how do we treat pouchitis? First line uh, treatment for pouchitis is antibiotics. And generally we'll do a course of ciprofloxacin, 500 milligrams twice a day for two weeks or flagell. Second line treatment is using a combination of these medications or using a four week course. And third line uh, would be using other alternative um, antibiotics. Patients can develop recurrent episodes of pouchitis, and generally we define recurrent acute pouchitis um, in patients who have recurrence um, happening more than once a year, but less than about three times a year. And in patients who have recurrent episodes, we can consider adding a probiotic, specifically the Visbiome formulation, as this is the one that has been um, studied in randomized clinical trials to help minimize the chance of recurrent pouchitis. There is, based on the data, no evidence or recommendation to treat every patient with a pouch with um, probiotics 
um, in the hope of preventing uh, the original occurrence or infrequent occurrences of pouchitis. Chronic pouchitis is a condition where patients are either antibiotic uh, dependent, meaning they receive a course of antibiotics, they respond to those antibiotics, but quickly after coming off of the antibiotics, they develop a recurrent flare or antibiotic refractory pouchitis, meaning patients who do not respond to antibiotics for the treatment of their pouchitis. And the treatment of these um, may involve adding advanced medications such as the original medications you may have used for your uh, inflammatory bowel disease and colitis. Um, for patients with antibiotic-dependent pouchitis, generally we uh, require treating with continuous antibiotics. We always want to do a repeat pouchoscopy to confirm um, the absence of inflammation and rule out alternate etiology. And generally, we find the lowest effective dose of antibiotics with intermittent gap period. So we'll use something like Cipro, 250 milligrams um, um, uh, twice a day with a one-week gap period to allow the bacteria, the gut microbiome, to replenish itself. We may also cycle antibiotics that may have um, variable effects. Um, so do one antibiotic at a week at a time, and then maybe give a gap period. We may also use advanced immunosuppressive medications such as vetalizumab um, for treatment of chronic antibiotic-dependent pouchitis. So what about antibiotic refractory pouchitis? For people that have relapsing, remitting, or continuous symptoms with inadequate response to typical antibiotics, we may add a corticosteroid such as budesonide, which is ileal-controlled and released uh, steroid. Um, and we may then consider advanced immunosuppressives as well. So to summarize, pouchitis is diagnosed by endoscopy and biopsy. Usually we should not be treating patients for pouchitis based on the assumption without an initial diagnosis of this. Um, patients are usually treated with a single antibiotic, and patients that have infrequent recurrences can be treated with the same antibiotic on a recurrent episode. In people that have um, frequent recurrences, we may consider a chronic antibiotic course to treat chronic um, antibiotic-dependent pouchitis, and we may add um, probiotics in these patients. People that don't respond to antibiotics, uh, the original course of antibiotics may be uh, treated with other antibiotics. We may also use oral um, budesonide, anti-inflammatory drugs such as mesalamine, and advanced immunosuppressive drugs and biologics to treat um, pouch uh, inflammation, pouchitis, and Crohn's disease, um, Crohn's-like disease of the pouch. Um, generally, we find a maintenance medication that works, and in patients who continue to flare on have refractory conditions, sometimes unlikely these patients do resort to having their uh, pouch excised or having an ileostomy. Thank you.